Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I want to thank Sarah for inviting me uh, to come up and speak. Um, and What's that? Oh, thank you. And at the last minute, I was like, how long does it take to get up there? She's like, three hours. I was like, oh, what did I get myself into after a long day of work, you know, being up since 5 o'clock? And uh, it only took like an hour and 15, 20 minutes, whatever, you know. And uh, But that's just the, the way my mind goes. It can go like a slingshot into the negative really quick. So, you know, I experience my alcoholism every day. You know, my untreated alcoholism slips in. It's that thought that slips in between, you know, the same thoughts that tells me that, you know, oh, man, this sucks, you know. So, anyway, it's it's great. It's beautiful up here. And uh, I'm I'm very glad she came and spoke at our home group recently. And uh, we do a – anyway, my sober date is October 22nd, 1996. Um. I started doing the big book about eight years into being dry and going insane. And that's part of my message, and I'm going to um, uh, talk about that, you know. Um, and uh, today, you know, I'm very active in uh, big book study and practice of the steps in my life and sponsoring others. So it's a... Uh, a big change from the selfish, self-centered person that I was, which is the root of my problems, which made me go insane and uh, separated me from God, and uh, where now, you know, God is the power that helps me to help others, which keeps me from being self-centered and going insane. Um, I uh, So anyway, basically we have a, uh, a meeting that uh, we probably have about 200 people there, um, Big Book Step Study. It's been growing uh, for the past seven years. Uh, I did start another one uh, where I lived down in Tom's River, about 45 minutes south, because I was all gung ho. Other people have to get this thing right when I first went through the steps, and and it did take off. Um, but there's a little line in the uh, in the, uh, um, the 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 Brown Book that says that we uh, should only have one home group, that we can put all our efforts into working with that home group. And um, I was reminded of that, and when that became a group, I left. And it's still going, um, and it's great to be – that was my initial thing, you know, just be Johnny Appleseed, you know. I'm just I'm, – I'm talking to you. I'm spreading some hope, and maybe it means I start a meeting over here. And then I walk away from it and let the people there that catch on fire to continue to carry that message if that's um, how God is going to use me today, you know. Um, But I I really, there was no doubt about it in my mind because I love my home group and the, the feeling and the energy in there. I have to have a place to go where I'm connected completely. And it doesn't mean where I'm the leader, doesn't mean where people, I, I noticed people were coming to me asking, how do I set the chairs up? You know, how do I make the coffee? And I'm like, you know, uh, I can't be, you know, that guy, uh, especially not now. You know, I just, I can see my ego or my, my, my finite brain taking over and running the show. And, um, uh, Originally, the prayers were, in starting that meeting, was that this is going to be for God, you know. Um, And uh, I had to walk away when it almost seemed like it was not for that purpose. Um, And it it works great on its own. Um, I... um, I definitely had a spiritual malady ever since I was uh, younger, before I started drinking. I know that, um, you know, uh, insecurity was a part of my uh, my being, like uh, questioning, doubting. 
um, not understanding, feeling as though um, I didn't get it, um, and I would calm that feeling down by finding the one thing that I did get and just honing in on that. Um, I was uh, I was a boy, so I was physical, and I like to burn things, and I like to break things, and uh, and I was. Uh, into sports, so I got into baseball. I was really into baseball, so that was good. Uh, I was in Boy Scouts, so I got to burn things and break things there. And uh, we were in, the, our patrol was the Pyro Patrol, so you know we we would have the uh, the Scout Reservation Fire Company, you know, four guys carrying a, a two wheel cart of water. Uh, to our bonfires that were like 15 feet diameter and about 50 feet high or whatever, you know. But um, that was it was great. That was it was good, clean fun. But even then, you know, I was looking for that extra something, you know, to take me out. And I started smoking cigarettes back then. And uh, I mean, I was I was probably in uh, you know fifth grade. Uh, when I officially started, uh, you know, drinking and smoking and uh, moving over, I, I lived on Seaside Heights, if you know what that looks like. Um, it's basically, especially in the winter, it's, uh, you know, whatever's left over from the summer, you know, and, and, uh, and there's all, all year round, there's there's partying going on there, and uh, that's basically the main focus of living. Um, and I found solace in that. I mean, I came from a middle class family that worked really hard to give me a decent house and and clothes on my back, and I sought out being um, having nothing, you know. And eventually, by uh, you know, 14, I'm in rehab. Um, 16, I was given the ultimatum, thanks to Al-Anon. Uh, either you get sober or you don't live in my house. And I said, but I want to go to school. And that wasn't an option to not to be homeless and go to school. So I quit school. and Because even at that age, I, I, I had lost the choice of, of power. I have lost power of choice and control at that age because uh, it was making decisions for me. It, it was making decisions for me long before I even noticed it, but that was the first big fork in the road that came up where I'm going to quit school and, and leave my house. I eventually went back to high school because uh, I got some sweet deal, you know, and I was able to go on this work program or something like that where I didn't have to um, hold it together for too long. I held it together for like a year and uh, moderated. You know, we moderate and uh, try to hold it together. And uh, um, then I just moved out, moved in with my high school girlfriend. She worked. She, had, she cleaned houses. And I pretty much, I was a... a, a, a you know, a, a mason laborer. I don't even want to say I was a mason or anything. You know, I carried block and I wheelbarrowed mud. And that's about all I could do because as soon as I got home, it was just party. We lived in Seaside Heights, so I would just party as soon as I got home until 2 a.m., get up and go work out in the heat. And, um, and that... Uh, resulted in getting married and uh, having a child and um, you know and thank God for that because uh, that was my first experience with um, you know that that was a gentle nudge you know and today I, I, I see God working in my life with gentle nudges instead of these uh, you know uh, shake and wake or hitting the brick wall because when I was younger, hitting a brick wall, you know, quitting school, um, you know, going to rehab, going to jail. These are all hitting brick walls, and gentle nudges is, here's a child. Um, you know, here's somebody that loves you, you know, a wife. 
and and I didn't see that, you know, of course. Um, alcoholism took hold there. I That happened, I was sober for about a year and a half, and that happened in that time, and I went berserk. My thinking mind, out of control. I, I was unable to manage how... My, what my reaction was to life. So I have a child and a wife now, and suddenly I have to work two jobs, and I have to take care of everything. And uh, I stopped going to meetings, of course, and I wasn't doing any steps anyway, so eventually that was going to wear out. But um, basically, uh, you know, I, I had no choice but to eventually get drunk. Um, what happens is, with me, is if I'm left untreated, my mind just gets so, it gets worse and worse and worse, and I feel more uncomfortable, more tense, and eventually I need ease and comfort, and I need to drink or get high, or uh, then there's a, a number of subsprees that I'll take, you know, prior to that, um, with some justification, you know, I'll, I'll say this is okay, whether it's eating, sex, uh, working out at the gym incessantly, um, dieting, all kinds of different things, making money, workaholism, which is later in my story. Um, so eventually the inevitable happens. Uh, about six years down the road, um, I'm going insane. I'm, I'm drinking, uh, you know, from morning until night. Uh, I'm doing some other non-conference approved uh, materials, and I'm uh, the doctor also put me on uh, painkillers, so I'm taking those in conjunction with everything else, and I'm uh, messing up at work. I'm not paying attention to my family, my wife, um, and I'm holding on. I'm, I'm continuing the cycle, which is the insanity that um, I know now is my al part of my alcoholic insanity. You know that. Not only do I make the wrong decision because I'm making it based on self and it's got to be something like I need, like my my drink, you know, um, but it doesn't matter if it seems like I can do it again today and tomorrow and the next day. I'm just going to pretend like nothing's wrong and I'm just going to keep doing it. And uh, so basically, uh, you know, she had to kick me out, which at the time was the best thing, and then I'm homeless again. I was homeless when I was 16, now I'm homeless again at 27. And uh, so I go for like six to eight months, luckily it was in April, so right before the summer, you know, it's best being homeless when it's going to be warm out, you know. And, um, and so I last until October, which is convenient, right, that's what I did the prior time. And uh, then... Uh, I go back to my dad's house, and in that time, I'm going insane. Uh, I'm, I'm cleaning windows uh, in houses, and I'm getting to the bar at 3 o'clock because that's all I could take. I would lie to the homeowner and say, I have to go on some other estimates. That was the same story every house. Since it was a new person, I could just use the same lie over and over so I could get to the bar by 3 o'clock and, and just start chugging. Um, and um, basically that's when I hit my physical bottom because I was just drinking so much for the past six years, six, seven years, that my body couldn't take any more of it. Uh, the bottom that I had hit when I had come into AA when I was 20 was consequential. There were things, and I only learned this by doing inventory and seeing it, and then I can say, okay, this was... I made this decision because, you know, because of the consequences. I felt like, you know, that things were bearing down on me, and that was the pressure from uh, outside. This time, I, my body was shaking. I was detoxing. Um, I couldn't think straight, and I saw that, okay, this is the problem. So I, I came back to AA. Uh, thank God. You know, my mom, who had passed away, had put all this effort into, she got into Al-Anon early, and put a lot of effort into getting me into 
rehab and making me go to meetings and everything. Um, even though it didn't uh, manifest while she was alive, it set the groundwork. It created uh, some tapes in my mind that I had a place to go, that I would have a, at least to hide in, you know, and get some safety. And I think that's, with newcomers, it's a, it's a, it's a lot about getting away from the consequences, uh, whether they're, they're legal or family or uh, physical, that, you know, it's uh, wearing them down physically or they're going insane where alcohol is actually starting to deteriorate my mind. And that's where I was at this time, where I was uh, um, hearing voices and uh, seeing things, and especially when I was detoxed. I mean, this was on a regular basis. You know, that wasn't when I was detoxing. And then when I was detoxing, it just got worse. Um, it took me about three days to uh, drink myself down with beer. And, uh, uh, you know, um, Benny Hinn came on at 3 a.m. And I prayed with him. And, yeah, it sounds funny, but it, it, it really, that was my first introduction to prayer. And it worked. I went right to sleep. I woke up the next morning. And that was it. Didn't I'm not going to say that. I'll say that I never drank or drugged again after that. But I, I did go insane again um, because I took my will back. I got far enough away from a drink or a drug that I could self-will it for 24 hours or two hours, you know, until I got to a meeting. But I would throw things. I would, you know... I went off and I did a lot of different sprees that were, I just didn't drink, you know. And, and, and the town, that's one of the reasons why I brought that big book meeting down to Tom's River, because the town, it just seemed like just don't drink and go to meetings was the message. You know, just, just meeting makers make it. And uh, after a period of eight years, you know, I was flipping you off. I was just like, this isn't, there's no solution here. I need to do more than just go to meetings. And whether it was because I didn't have life skills or because I suffer from alcoholism, you know, a mental mental illness, you know. It's a, uh, a strange mental twist that I have. And uh, I, I, I'm about at 51%. And at any time that it goes below, that's as high as I go. And it's 1%. Then I'm down below that 50-yard line and I'm toast. I could do anything, you know, insane. Um, so I, I did that, you know, I, I had a sponsor that would talk to me about things and, uh, I had, uh, a group that I made coffee in and, uh, and I went to four meetings a week for eight years and, uh, and I tried a number of things and one of the things that I was always trying was to make money, um, I thought money was going to uh, help me feel better about myself. I always felt less than. I felt empty. I thought that was going to fill the void. Um, and I worked really hard at that. Um, and uh, I have a I have a uh, shovel that looks like a ladder. And every time I've set up that ladder, it just digs a little deeper, it digs me a little deeper. And um, so this high school dropout is making $75,000 a year working at Wachovia Bank, and I'm feeling big, you know. Um, I have a nervous breakdown. I break out in shingles. Uh, um, I, I go back to work. I'm no longer the 100 percent uh, turnaround guy. I'm suddenly the uh, 20 percent guy. They're asking me what's the matter. We're going to have to let you go. And I'm like, you're going to have to let me go. I can't quit. Because I knew that I had to collect unemployment at least, you know, on the base. But, um, and that was um, part of my spiritual bottom. That was the beginning of it. Um, it was uh, it wasn't a gentle nudge, you know. That was one of the brick walls, and that was the um, the harsh reality that um, 
self-reliance uh, does not, I can't do this on self-reliance. Um, I can hold in there for however long, you know, but eventually I'm going to snap and it, it's happened over and over again. Um, and I had to seek help and I was asking around. I went back to meetings. I had skipped going to meetings for, you know, like three months or whatever. So I went back. And I'm asking for help, and people are saying, do 90 again, you know, who's your sponsor, this stuff. And I was just like, all this stuff is noise, you know, it's giving me a headache, you know. There's, I've already tried all this. Um, but um, somebody said, hey, come out to the diner with us, and uh, you want to come and see the speaker. And we went to go see a speaker who uh, was talking about eighth and ninth step and digging really deep, and uh, it, he disturbed me about uh, all the things I wasn't doing. He was, uh, you know, uncovering uh, like it was nothing for him. It was coming out of the big book. That's basically all the stuff, you know, the teachings of the big book, and then the results that he had received. And, and basically before big book and then after. And, um, but it was all new to me and it was upsetting me about my truth. And, um, basically I had to, uh, uh, go up to him and ask him for help, but I'll do it next week, you know. So it took me two weeks to do that. So I went back. It was, luckily it was a, a multi night workshop and, um, I, I, I actually asked somebody else to introduce me to him because uh, I was afraid that, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe you would say, get out of here, kid, you bother me, you know, or whatever. And uh, so I went up, I asked, asked him for help. I said, I'm the guy with 10 years that wants to kill himself, you know, that you talked about. And uh, untreated alcoholic, you know, sick and suffering inside AA, you know. How, I can't take much more of this. and. Uh, so he introduced me to uh, who was going to be my sponsor, and uh, he had taken me through the steps. It took me about five months, went there once a week, went through the steps, um, and um, for the first time, uh, somebody was sitting down across the table from me, actually wanted me to come to his house and sit down, and he was willing to take the time, and which was kind of new. For me, uh, somebody that uh, seemed like he cared about me, but I know that he had to do these things in order to stay alive himself. Um, but at the same time, he cared about me. He was mindful, uh, and uh, and he was harsh, which um, is a uh, a loving quality. Um, somebody that doesn't let you lie to yourself. You know, and uh, and I needed that, you know, because I had been lying to myself for so long, I couldn't differentiate true from false in sobriety, you know. So regardless, if you're here for 10 years, if you're not doing anything and you're living in your in your delusion, you're still this is this is uh, something that I've come to see that I have to wake up again every day. I have to wake up again um, to truth. By doing inventory, by working with others, every time that God places somebody in my path, it's because there's there's a mirror standing in front of me. There's something that I'm supposed to take notice of. And whether it's my own selfishness, because oh, I don't want to work with this guy, you know, for whatever reason, you know. Uh, it could be something like that, or it could be something like this person just happens to be going through what a coincidence, right? Just happens to be going through something that I'm trying to hide under my carpet over here, you know, or whatnot. So there's there's a lot of um, strange little happenings that go on when you're involved in the uh, process of working with others and helping others. Uh, miracles that help you rise to meet the day, you know. Um, so basically, uh, you know, I went through the work, went through the steps with them, and um, I, I caught a little bit on fire, and I started just doing what 
the other things that he was saying as far as uh, I took on sponsors, uh, I actually took on a sponsee. Um, that's what I meant to say. I took on a sponsee. I, I was like on step three or something. And he's just keeping four weeks behind us and you'll be okay. And um, it was a godsend. I mean, uh, I don't know. The guy had HIV, emphysema. He had liver, whatever, he had failure. He was on a plethora of uh, pills to keep him alive. He was like 70 years old. He was a homeless guy from Florida for 28 years. And um, he was on a machine. He would breathe. Uh, he would smoke while he was on an oxygen machine. And I hated cigarettes because I had quit three years prior. Um, so I had a, my agenda, right, my motive. Um, but I would withstand it, you know, because I had to share this message. And I honestly thought that he was going to, you know, get it and everything. And today I found not to have a judgment, whether somebody's going to get it or not. That, again, I'm just Johnny Appleseed. I'm just here to share the message. If um, God can speak through me, I can be a channel. God could speak through me, and maybe you'll get something from it. Otherwise, I've done my job. I show up, I suit up, I follow through, and then I'm done. I'm, I can't be uh, trying to mastermind uh, your sobriety, the results that you get from each time we sit down. Uh, that's just basically setting myself up to get angry or disappointed. Um, so I, I share that, obviously, you know, um, he stopped, and I was all upset, stopped uh, wanting me to, to see him, but he had pushed me through four through nine. And uh, then, and, and that was his purpose, you know, for me, anyway, in my life, uh, wherever he is now. Um, so basically, uh, that sets me up to, you know, start work in 10, 11, and 12, and... Um, and carrying, you know, these steps that it, it says, you know, we show others precisely how we have recovered through our actions. I would think it would might add there, like, yeah, I'm going to show precisely how I recovered if you want to sit down and go through the work. But everybody else, I really have to show them precisely how I recovered or not through my actions, through my behaviors, you know, and my kind and loving towards all. The um, after that point, um, I started sponsoring guys, and I've, I had sponsored about a dozen or so guys in the next uh, two years. And um, then uh, I went through the work again, and uh, immediately after that time, I had uh, started the other big book study meeting, uh, trying to move you know the big book into a town that was kind of predominantly speaker meetings and. Uh, discussion meetings um, where problems were being discussed and drunkologues were being spoken. Um, and a uh, little bit of a selfish, you know, obviously I, I wanted people to uh, talk with <laughs> about the big book and, and, and about the uh, solution that I had found. So um, I, I started that and uh, right now it's running without me like I said um, but I also had uh, started doing a lot of meditation and um, you know reading some other books and having some other teachers in my life uh, to um, kind of try to find out what my higher power is a little more you know dig a little deeper into that um, I'm not a uh, uh, religious type of person. I mean, I went to church when I was a kid. Um, and But I wanted to find out more about, you know, how some of these people were finding peace in their life, were, in, were, were fulfilled, and feeling love in their heart. And um, so I did a bunch of that stuff, you know. Um, there, there's a lot of different things out there, and a lot of, a lot of. Uh, I, what I found is that I, I needed silence. I needed uh, to silence the mind, 
so I practiced a lot of meditation and um, and then when I was going to have thought, um, it was a lot easier to have that singleness of purpose, you know, that's one of our traditions and it's one of our 36 principles, uh, spiritual principles, so um, I, I had, I have a mind that goes in six different directions at one time. You're probably saying that, listening to me speak, man, he's jumping all over the place. That's what it feels like from here. But, um, but the thing is that in my life it goes and say, hey, look at this new product I'm making. Hey, look at this book I'm writing. Hey, look at this uh, album I'm recording. Hey, look at this, uh, you know, painting I'm drawing. It's just like all at the same time. It's all going on at the same time. I'm just going from one to another like a bee, you know. And uh, how do I stop that? That's insanity because eventually none of those things are going to get done and self-pity is going to come in. And I'm going to start looking at myself like I'm a loser again, you know. And that's that was always the end result of being the jack of all trades, you know, master of none, is that, wow, you know, look at these people, like my brother and sister, they did one thing, they did it good, and now they're, you know, where they're at. And I couldn't stop hopping from one thing to another because my mind was incessantly obsessing over something new, the next, the bigger, better thing, or um, fantasizing, basically, is what it was doing. Um, and that's more about the ego. And I, I went off into studying the ego, you know, so I could recognize it, and I could probably name what has 36 flavors. You know, I could probably name them all, but I, it's not Alcoholics Anonymous at this, you know. So the thing is that um, I uh, I don't even have my clock, my watch on. So is there a clock anyway behind me? All right. <laughs> Thank you. And um, so you know, I am uh, I'm sponsoring a lot of guys. Uh, I, I go back to my home group. I I'm starting to meditate. Um, I. I had uh, gone back to school. I moved in with my father um, under the guise that because he was getting older, he needed company. And although that may be true, um, selfish and self-centered to the extreme, I have to be able to see my motives. Um, and it was uh, at that time I had, uh, I was recuperating. I had started doing that in the beginning. I was recuperating from my nervous breakdown. Um, I wasn't working, which is my natural state. And because uh, I'm lazy, sloth, one of my seven deadly sins. And, um, but I was doing a ton of praying and a ton of meditating. And uh, God was answering these prayers. And, uh, and the spirit was filling me and, and, and leading me to do things and go back to college or go to college, I should say, because it was never done before, was uh, one of the things. And uh, just go and walk around the campus, the local, you know, uh, county college kind of thing. Just walk around the campus and a uh, bunch of feelings rushed through me that um, nobody wants to be feel like a loser or feel self-pity uh, that everybody else went to college and I didn't, you know, I'm less than. And when I walked around there, I was feeling um, sp uplifting spirit flow through me. And um, so I went in and I signed up. And uh, unfortunately, it took me so long that the money ran out. I eventually got funding. I paid for it in the beginning, but then I got some grant or something, and it ran out, and I have like 56 of 64 credits. So I'm right on the cusp of it, and the money runs out. But eventually I'll get it. You know, I, I had to take some time off, and uh, I'm not living with my dad anymore, so I don't have any money for my job. But... um. While I'm living there, I'm doing a lot of things, praying, meditating, I'm writing incessantly, and I'm, I'm doing homework, and I'm getting my brain back. I felt like uh, when I was working as a real estate appraiser, it, very analytical, juggling tons of uh, data, 
in my mind. Uh, you had to know all the areas, all the zonings, all the valuations and numbers and everything. And I, you know, like I could really identify with Bill. You know, I, I, I pictured myself as a genius, and I've done that a couple times in my life. That you know, I'd be like, I got this down. I really got this down, and that that was so insane, you know, because an alcoholic never has it down because there's always a bigger, better deal. And if I can get this county down, I can get the whole state down, you know, not just one other county. I think I'm going to know the whole state, you know, and all the laws and rules, and and because I had a boss that knew that he could do it, I can, you know. Um, I started drooling way before that ever came. So I go back to college and I do that and I'm writing and I'm uh, doing a lot of meetings and I'm sponsoring a lot of guys. And uh, this whole process was just growing me. It was just fitting myself. And this is the whole purpose of the steps, to fit myself to be of maximum service to God and to others. And that's all that was doing. It was all that was, uh, I was just basically at the gym, you know, this whole time, whether my path had to go, you know, back to my dad's house or to the college, you know, they, they, I went through the big book with my sponsor twice before I went to uh, college. And, I mean, I couldn't, I don't know how to study. I never learned how to study or anything. But the way he went through the big book with me enabled me to, uh, I got a 3.5 right now, so we'll see what happens when I go back because I saved algebra for last. So, right, save the hardest for last, you know, because I want to, I tried to put like one difficult class with an easy one so I could kind of mix it up, but and that was smart, but um, I saved math for last, algebra anyway. Um, As far as um, going through uh, the steps, you know, I uh, I did most of my first step while I was out there, but I didn't know I was doing it, so I couldn't know that I did it when I got here. I needed to sit down and have somebody comb through my past with me so that I could see, it's, it seems like only when I admit to you the truth of what my experience was that I can actually see the truth of what it was. Um, if it, it says in the big book that, you know, we find that a, um, a self-appraisal is insufficient. And that's not verbatim, but um, if I'm just thinking about things, uh, by the time it comes to my conscious, it seems like it goes through the BS filters and it turns into some kind of, um, like, messed up. It's a lie by the time it gets there. It's been distorted enough to where it's not the truth. So um, if I'm going to admit to my innermost self that I'm an alcoholic, you know, uh, I have to know it um, it has to basically be, you know, the, the, the wood and nails of it. You know, it can't be a facade. It can't be looking pretty. Um, the, like I said, you know, my sponsor would um, uh, be very blunt and harsh, and, uh, and uh, that was the best thing for me um, because the truth that I, I needed to know, it really couldn't be delivered in any kind of soft manner, you know, that I'm an ass or that, you know, uh, I'm a coward, you know. Um, and these are basic truths that were, you know, inherent in my being as because I'm a fearful, insecure person because I'm living life by ego uh, that I had no other choice to be any of those things. Um, and... Uh, cover it all up with, you know, the destruction heavy drinking was bringing and uh, drug use, you know, and everything else, all the other sprees that I was doing. Um, and, uh, you know, I was like, with two, I was like, this is a piece of cake because I believe in God. 
you know. I believe that there's a power, you know, up in the heavens or whatever. We we went to church. I went to church till I was 12, right? Till I was 11. Um, and learned about it. But that wasn't the type of belief that I needed. Uh, it was it was good enough to start, you know, but eventually I had to enlarge upon that if I was going to keep going. Um, but it enabled me to have enough trust in that this guy was telling me the truth, that he was going to help me, and he was going to help me get through four through nine, and that the process was going to work. Because um, I had believed other things, and um, with uh, my parents, they didn't lie to me. Uh, I find out today it's, it's far, far, far too late uh, to, to know after they're gone. Wow, everything that they said was true. You know, I had all these other fantasies of what life was and what the truth was, and and they weren't. I was just making that up as I was going along. Um, going through the work is, you know, really uh, doing a lot of writing. It's doing a lot of, uh, you know, we we know that self knowledge isn't going to sustain us. But it has to be reached. I have to start uncovering my truth about uh, my drinking, what my conception of God is, what my relationship with God is. Um, no matter how small or insufficient, it's good enough to make a start. So I start writing inventory. And I work with guys that now have been through it four or five times. And then I work with guys, and that gets a little nerve-wracking because you're like, oh, they're judging me. And then I've worked with guys that are brand new, and then I feel like like I'm judging them because I'm like, oh, man, they're not writing enough, you know, or it's not deep enough. And then I'm like, just let it, let it go, you know, let it be what it's going to be. You know, they're going to go through it at, as much as they can go through it, you know. And uh, and I just encourage them to do as much as they possibly can. And uh, they might come back in a year and be like, wow, I just remembered 50 things, you know, and, and whether or not, you know. So I it keeps me, that's part of the mirror that I see of myself. When I work with another guy, I, I'm always looking at myself after I leave and, you know, reviewing maybe some of the thoughts or ideas that ran through my head, you know, um, asking God how I could help him better next time. You know, what can I do? This one guy that I'm working with today is teaching me how to work with him and others tomorrow. And it's always going to be like that. I'm always going to be able to review my day. They do it in football and baseball. They review the tapes and they go, okay, look, you're stepping here when you should be stepping there. Let's, you know, work on that. And they're making their game better, and my job is to fit myself. You know, I do as much as I can. And it's like I say, um, you know, God, please help me get dressed today. And then I end up walking outside naked <laughs> because I didn't get myself dressed today. I'm he, he had provided clothing, a job to buy that clothing, a house to put the, the dresser in, all these things, you know, are a culmination of... Uh, the provisions that were given to me. Um, and I have to see that, you know, God moves my feet to, to walk, he moves my hands to work. He's, he moves my mind to think. And, um, and I have to see that to the extent that, okay, I'm going to do as much as I can and then try to discern when, and it's usually because of, I'm experiencing pain or difficulty, that I'm starting to do God's job and I need to back off and have faith that those things are going to work. I do as much as I can. Uh, and since it's a gray area, especially for this alcoholic, I constantly step over that line a little bit. And uh, But the signals that I've done that are getting a little clearer. Um, you know, step 12 is basically, uh, you know, carrying this message and carrying the results, like I was talking about before, you know, how do I 
show up in the lives of other people today? How do I show up for my family and how do I show up for my friends, my employer? And uh, how do I show up for the stranger, you know, that I meet? Um, it's really important that, um, you know, it says all throughout our day in step 10, we were watching my fearful, angry, self-pitying. We're looking for excitement. And um, I really have to do that uh, thoroughly and wake up. The more that I do that and wake up to it, the shorter the time span comes between unconsciousness and consciousness. Um, you know, last time uh, I gave somebody the finger, this time I mouthed the words. <laughs> Next time, maybe I'll just not mouth the words and just think it and, but recognize that, hey, you know, I'm, uh, I'm getting angry, you know because this person needed to cut me off to get off the exit that he would have had to drive 10 miles to, to find again. And maybe I can just step on the brake a little bit and back off and let them go through. But um, selfish self-centeredness, the root of all my troubles, makes that virtually impossible if I'm unconscious and I'm never going to get conscious if I'm not thinking about it throughout the day, doing as much as I can to get dressed. You know, um, prayer throughout the day, you know. Um, we set up a, a plan to pray every hour. Um, so I would take one minute every hour to do a simple thank you, God, prayer. Um, help me to do better this next hour. Um, and that suddenly, it, it creates a like a vacuum. Boom, I come right back to my feet. I'm standing right here. I'm suddenly, I shrink down. It seems like my projection gets, the, its reach becomes infinite, and then I become God in my fantasy. And it just reaches out, and it reaches out if, as the day goes on. And uh, when I do those prayers and I get centered in that moment, everything comes right back to ground zero, and I'm standing right here. And then... Um, being humble isn't an impossibility. It's a it's a it's a possibility. It, it's actually it happens, um, and that's that's how it seems like. And and then again, as I move out, and then somebody says something that conflicts with my belief, or or that I'm a jerk, or whatever. You know, they they uh, there's contrast or conflict, and uh, then I can I start fantasizing again, moving out, or I don't have enough money. It could be no, any number of uh, things that could make me uh, lose sight of reality. I, um, I'm active in my home group. Um, I, I started another uh, big book workshop uh, in, in Tom's River again on a different night. Um, where actually people come in for six to 12 weeks and go through, one person goes through the whole thing. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun being involved. Um, this is a little different where I'm the chief cook and bottle washer. All I need to do is bring coffee pot coffee and, uh, you know, and a tape recorder. And basically, uh, I'm just having fun with it instead of, uh, you know, creating a group and all that stuff. So, was that my signal? <laughs> uh, oh, it wasn't? <laughs> um, I thought it was a gentle nudge, you know. Hey, it's time to stop. But, uh, I, you know, I encourage everybody, if you haven't gone through the steps through the big book and you're an alcoholic and you have an alcoholic mind, the time will come when you'll have to because you'll get slammed into a brick wall. But if you want to, do it before you have to. Um, it's, it's almost impossible to tell somebody to do that, though. But... Um, you know, listen, look for those those gentle nudges, you know, that are, are, are pulling you 
pushing you in that direction and and getting involved in AA uh, after you've had experience. Sandy Beach said something that was awesome, and he said, you want your guy to uh, get involved in service, take him through the steps. You won't be able to stop him. You know, and uh, that basically was my experience. You know, I, I begrudgingly made coffee and did whatever, set up chairs after meetings before I had an experience with the work. And afterwards, um, I, I every meeting I go to, I clean up at. And uh, I'm starting meetings because there's not enough work for me to do in AA. <laughs> so... Uh, I hope that, you know, I may have said at least one thing that somebody, uh, uh, it brought the spirit into them. And uh, I want to thank you for inviting me out. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.